and maybe limiting in places up to a third of emissions reductions needed by 2030 for the Paris Agreement, less than two degrees, would be obtained with these natural climate solutions. It's a, an absolute pleasure that we have um, Professor Dave Goulson with us today. Um, Dave is one of the preeminent experts in the world on bees and insects in general. He's the Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex and he's specializing in bee ecology. He's published more than 300 scientific articles on ecology and conservation of bumblebees and other insects. It's great to have you with us, Dave. Um, thank you very much. Looking forward to the talk. Over to you. Thanks, Ed. Um, pleasure to be here this morning on a beautiful sunny day. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, insects, my favourite subject. Now just bear with me while I share my screen with you. Uh, this is always a bit of a, a moment of truth because it sometimes goes a little wrong, but this is looking very promising. Uh, just pause a second while it thinks. And any second now, we should have it in slideshow. There we go, marvellous. So yes, insects. Um, I, I've been fascinated by insects all my life. Um, I don't know why, but from the age of four or five or six or something like that, I, I, one of my earliest memories is um, finding these little yellow and black caterpillars on some weeds at the edge of the school playground and, and collecting them and putting them in my lunchbox and taking them home and rearing them up. And eventually they hatched into these beautiful black and red moths. And I, I was just completely captivated. I thought this was magic. Uh, cinnabar moths, you might recognize. Um, and I, I've been lucky enough to, to, to be, find a way to make a living from studying insects. So I've, I've, I've been uh, able to kind of pursue my childhood hobby, which is great. Um, now, Actually, I think many people go through a kind of bug phase when they're young. Uh, this is my um, youngest son, Seth, with his pet cockchafer, Colin. Sadly, Colin's no longer with us, but, um, but Seth was very fond of him while he lasted. And he's really fascinated by insects, as are, as are many kids. But the sad reality is that many of us grow out of that as we get older. And the reaction of most teenagers or adults to uh, something buzzing near them is usually to try and swat it and kill it. They think it's, it's gonna bite them or sting them or give them a disease or do something. I'm not quite sure, but it's, they're, they're frightened um, and they don't appreciate insects. And I think that's really sad. Um, uh, so my kind of mission in life is to try and persuade people to love insects or at the very least to respect insects because they're hugely important. But before I, say more about insects. Let's look at the, at the bigger picture. So obviously this, this you probably recognize, um, it's where we live, it's our home. It's this extraordinary rock hurtling through space with five, maybe 10 million species clinging to its surface. We, we don't know, we're a long, long way from cataloging the diversity of life on earth. Um, we've named about one and a half million species so far, but that total goes up all the time. Um, and so it's our home, it's our source of food and water and air and, and, and inspiration and beauty. It's, it's everything. Um, and, and therefore it, it's, it's really tragic and ridiculous and absurd that we aren't looking after it. That we're, we are doing terrible damage to this amazing, beautiful planet. Um, of course, we're all familiar with most of these issues and I don't want to, I haven't got time to go through them all in any detail, but climate change clearly is a massive threat to, to the future of life on our planet as we know it at least. But that, although climate change tends to get the bulk of the attention, there are a whole bunch of other interrelated environmental catastrophes unraveling right now. We're eroding the world's soils at a terrifying rate. We're polluting soils and seas and rivers and the air with plastics and heavy metals and fertilizers and pesticides and so on and so on. Um, you know these, I, I won't go through them all. We, we see these terrible images on the television of the, the Amazon burning and, and so on. Um, my real focus, of course, is on biodiversity loss. Um, and uh, we are now, scientists agree in the midst of the the sixth mass extinction event so right now 
species are going extinct um, uh, faster than they have for 65 million years uh, since the dinosaurs went extinct uh, when a meteor struck. Um, and the, the, but this extinction event is unique because it's, it's the first one that's been caused by a species on the planet, us, of course. And right now, species are going extinct somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the natural average historical rate, um, which means that, that perhaps um, during this one hour session today, a species somewhere will go extinct. That's roughly one an hour and the extinction rate is accelerating, uh, which is pretty terrifying. Now, most people focus on, when you talk about extinctions, they think about uh, polar bears or pandas or large uh, mammals and birds tend to get the bulk of attention. Um, and it was only really quite recently that people began to appreciate that it isn't just these large creatures that are going extinct, but the small creatures that we pay much less attention to are also in deep trouble. And I think that this really came to the fore of people's appreciation back in three years ago in 2017, when a paper was published from Germany. Um, it was uh, based on malaise trap uh, data. So that funny thing top right there is a malaise trap. And uh, it, it, it catches flying insects, all types of flying insects. Uh, and the, what the chart shows you is the, the daily catch per trap and how it changed between 1989 and 2016. Um, and as you can see, it fell. The, the catch, the weight of insects caught each day fell. It fell by 76% in 26 years. So essentially three quarters of the insects, this was right across Germany, seemed to have disappeared in really quite a short period, about half my lifetime. Uh, and this is really worrying. And if this were the only data set that showed this, we might dismiss it as a quirk or a fluke. Perhaps something weird is happening in Germany, but I could show you sadly many other similar charts. For example, we know in the UK that our butterfly populations are down by roughly 60% since 1976. Um, uh, so th this, as far as we know, is a general phenomenon, certainly in, in, in Europe and North America, where we have good long term data on some insects, they're disappearing. And that should really worry us um, because insects are vitally important, as was put quite nicely by E.O. Wilson, an American biologist. And I won't read this out to you, but he um, he basically said it if we people were to somehow suddenly disappear from the planet, the planet would do really well without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, as he put it, the environment would collapse into chaos. Uh, and he's absolutely right. And I want to explain why. So uh, insects make up the majority of biodiversity. They, uh, of the one and a half million species we've named so far, um, one million are different types of insect. Um, so, so they are biodiversity, or a very big chunk of it. And they're also food for a very large proportion of the remainder of species. Uh, most birds, bats, amphibians, reptiles, freshwater fish, all feed upon insects. So if you're a, one of these beautiful bee eaters uh, living in Germany, for example, then three quarters of your food supply has disappeared in the last 26 years. Um, which is obviously going to have major impacts on, on anything that relies on insects for food. Insects do many other things too. Um, so because there are so many of them and they're so diverse, they're involved in more or less every ecological process one might think of. They're vitally important via control agents of pests. They are intimately involved in, in recycling of all sorts of organic materials from cow pats to dead bodies to tree trunks to leaves and so on and they play a really important role in keeping the soil healthy and sequestering carbon and you name it they're involved in it happening uh, which is why um, Ed Wilson said if the insects weren't there things would collapse into chaos. Of course the thing that insects do that, that we appreciate best I think is they pollinate. 87% um, of all the plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of um, animal, and in a few cases that's done by birds, hummingbirds and so on, or even bats in a few instances, but the very large majority of those plant species 
rely upon some kind of insect. Um, not just bees, I should stress. Pollinators include many other types of insects, including butterflies and moths, numerous species of flies, um, wasps, beetles, and so on, all get in on the act. And between them, they pollinate the large majority of plant species on Earth and 75% of all the crops that we grow. So if we didn't have um, insect pollinators, then our supermarkets would not look like this. We wouldn't have this extraordinary uh, bounty, this, this range of beautiful fruits and veg that come from all over the world year round. Um, things would look rather different without the pollinators. We wouldn't have everything from apples and strawberries and raspberries to um, squashes, peppers, tomatoes, chili peppers, even things like um, coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollinators. So life would be dire indeed. Um, and in fact, the, the, we couldn't feed the human population without them. Um, literally uh, millions, perhaps billions of people would die. Um, so it's, it's pretty important that we look after these little things. To do that, we need to understand why they're declining. Um, and uh, this is quite a complicated subject. We know there are many causes of insect declines and I haven't got time to go into them. Um, from a UK perspective, perhaps the biggest driver has been the loss of flower rich uh, grassland habitats, which we used to have uh, enormous areas of. Um, so uh, this is a beautiful example of a surviving piece of flower rich grassland. I took that photograph in South Uist in the Outer Hebrides. A um, hundred years ago, Britain had about 7 million hectares of this kind of habitat, lowland hay meadows and chalk downland. Uh, and we lost 97% of it in the 20th century. It was all swept away and replaced with either monocultures of ryegrass for pasture or with monocultures of crops like this. And it's self-evident really why that from an insect's perspective is catastrophic. Now an integral part of the way, it's not just that the habitat has been lost, but what has been replaced with is now treated with lots of pesticides. Um, just to give you, this is quite a, a big subject and I could give you a whole talk about pesticide use and its impacts on the environment. But um, in the UK, farmers currently apply 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticides to the landscape every year um, and each field on average gets just over 17 applications per year and that's a mix of insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, molluscicides. Basically we try to kill anything that, that, that dares to live in our fields um, and grow a sort of a, 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 have a, a field which just has one species in it, nothing else at all, the crop. Um, which, as I'll come back to later, seems like a nuts way to try to grow food to me. Anyway, um, uh, of course, it's not just farmers that use pesticides. You can pop to your garden centre or even your supermarket and buy a whole range of pesticides. And I think that's completely nuts myself. Um, uh, and even if you don't buy pesticides, uh, and perhaps you're keen on making your garden wildlife friendly, um, you might well buy bee-friendly plants from your local garden centre. They're usually labelled as such, often with the RHS's Perfect for Pollinator logo there. Um, now, we recently did some research on these plants. We bought uh, plants from all the big name garden centres, DIY shops, places like B&Q and Homebase. Um, we bought just the bee-friendly plants and we screened them for pesticides and 90 8% of them contained pesticides, most of them multiple pesticides, 75% of them contained insecticides. And these are being sold as bee friendly. So clearly they're not as, as bee friendly as you thought. Okay, so that's a very quick skim through why insects may be declining, or at least some of the factors. What can we do about it? Well, the good news is that there is lots we can do about it. Um, many of these conservation issues are really doom and gloom and you feel absolutely helpless about the Amazons in flames or the ice caps melting or whatever. Um, but insects live all around us. They live in our, in, our, in our gardens, they live in our local parks. Um, so we can all get involved and most of them haven't gone extinct yet. And unlike rhinos, insects can breed really quickly so they can recover in no time at all if we just give them the right conditions. Uh, and so for most of the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on uh, our, 
something that I'm really keen on, which is that we could welcome insects in to live in our urban areas. Um, and that that could provide a, a network of habitat that could support an enormous diversity of insect life. Um, there are 22 million gardens in the UK covering an area of nearly half a million hectares, which is a bigger area than all of our nature reserves. Just imagine if all of those were insect friendly and if all the parks and the road verges and the roundabouts and so on were also um, insect friendly, then that's a, that's a ready-made network and there's not really any downside. There's no cost to pay uh, to inviting insects to live in our cities. I got so excited about this that I wrote a book about it. Sorry to plug my book, but there you go, The Garden Jungle. And essentially the point I try to make in the book is that gardening can be good or bad. Um, people think of gardening as a, as a green activity. Um, and it can be, it's possible to have a garden which captures carbon and which teems with life. And it's also possible to, to be a gardener who does terrible harm, who creates a garden that's almost sterile and that has huge impacts on the environment. And you can guess what I think this one is. This is a, my idea of hell. Um, this is actually a garden which has been astroturfed. It's plastic grass. You can even buy plastic ivy these days to, to pin to your plastic fence. Um, it's thoroughly depressing. Um, and this stuff is being widely used. But uh, of course, most people don't go quite that far, but many people's idea of gardening is to jump in the car, drive to the garden center, uh, get a big trolley, buy a plastic sack full of peat-based compost, buy some fertilizer, some pesticide bottles, some pretty flowers grown in disposable plastic pots, probably reared in peat, probably treated with lots of pesticides and throw them all in the trolley spend lots of money and then plant them in the garden and sprinkle all the chemicals around. That's not very green. It has enormous environmental impacts. But gardens can be amazing places. There was uh, one really interesting example of, um, there's a lady called Jenny Owen who uh, gardened in, she had a, a small, very small garden in urban Leicester. And she spent 35 years cataloging how many species she could find in her garden. Um, and she managed to, to, to find 2,600 different species uh, of organism living in her garden, about 2,000 of which were insects. So gardens can be biodiversity hotspots or they can be devoid of life like this one. So how do we make them more wildlife friendly? Well, um, we get rid of the pesticides for a start. I would love to see pesticides completely banned in urban areas. Um, I think there's just no excuse for them. They're, these are poisons that we can buy without any training and spray around in our garden where our children play, where our dogs play and so on. It's absolutely nuts. France, I should say, have banned all pesticides for urban use and I think that's brilliant. I'd also encourage people to, to mow less. This is a really, really simple time-saving, money-saving uh, thing that everyone can do if they have a lawn. Uh, and instead of trying to aspire to have a kind of Wimbledon tennis court with stripes on it in your garden, why not have a garden, a, a lawn like this one? This is my lawn and all I do is not mow very often. I never planted any wildflowers in it at all. It's full of flowers that just spring up if you stop mowing. And it'd be great if every lawn, I think, looked like that one. It'd also be great if we could plant more of the right kinds of flowers. Now, you might think all flowers would be good for um, uh, for insects or pollinators because the flower, that's what a flower is for. Flowers evolved, of course, not to look pretty, um, but to attract pollinators. That's the function of the colourful petals and the scent and everything else. But unfortunately, we've tinkered with plants. We've plant breeders have played around with flowers, made them uh, more attractive to us humans, or at least what they thought was more attractive. But often in doing so, they've made them less attractive or sometimes completely unattractive to insects and double varieties of flowers are a really nice example of that. So here we've got um, double roses, double cherries, double hollyhocks along the top, and then the single versions closer to the kind of more natural wild uh, flowers below. And the ones at the bottom are really attractive to insects. The ones at the top are absolutely useless. They're mutants in which the anthers that normally produce the pollen have mutated into extra petals. So they're just a bundle of petals with no pollen in the middle, complete waste of time. From an, I, 
I should say also, I think they're rather hideous too. So um, I'd strongly encourage you next time you're buying a plant to avoid a double variety. Um, and generally aim for traditional cottage garden flowers, herbs and so on. There's tons of information out there about which ones are best, um, including YouTube videos from me. So if you want some top tips for which plants to grow in your garden to encourage pollinators, uh, go online and find me on YouTube and I'll tell you more. Um, I'd also encourage people to be more tolerant of weeds. We've sort of arbitrarily declared some plants undesirable and we spend a lot of time and effort trying to get rid of them. But actually most of them are native wildflowers. All of these are native wildflowers, it's actually rather beautiful. These are all ones that I grow in my garden and the insects love them, they look great. I don't quite understand why we're so obsessed by trying to kill them all the time. A uh, couple of other little things you might do in, in your garden. You might make a bee hotel. Uh, these are really easy to make um, with a piece of wood and a drill or some bits of bamboo. Um, great little projects, things that you could do with the kids. Um, get them ready for early spring when the red mason bees top right emerge and might occupy them. Uh, and later in the year, if you're lucky, you'll get leaf cutter bees bottom right there, uh, occupying the same things. They're really cool. Um, or you might make a hoverfly lagoon. Ooh, I, for some reason, my pictures of hoverfly lagoons have all vanished. Um, sorry about that. Uh, a hoverfly lagoon, again, you can find a YouTube video about how to make one, um, is a small puddle, yeah, any waterproof container, fill it with water, um, put in some, some lawn clippings or uh, leaves that have fallen off the trees and let it, as soon as they start to rot down, the smell will attract female hoverflies of certain species that have aquatic larvae. Uh, hoverfly lagoons, look them up online. It's a really, again, a fun little project to do with the kids. And one more, why not also, while you're at it, make an earwig hotel. Uh, I love earwigs. I've written a whole chapter about them in my book and they're really, really easy to provide little refuges for like this one made out of a flower pot stuffed full of straw. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Um, I was supposed to try and keep to 20 minutes-ish. Um, so I've talked about gardens and how we could make gardens wildlife friendly, welcome insects in to live with us in our cities. And that would be great. It would be great for biodiversity. Um, it would be great for our children to grow up in gardens surrounded by bumblebees and butterflies and so on. But the reality is the majority of the countryside is farmland. The majority of Britain is farmland. 70% of Britain is farmland. And even if all of our gardens were great for insects, that would still leave the majority of our land pretty much hostile, inhospitable to wildlife. Um, now, I haven't got time to go into this. This is really, it needs another talk. Um, but I have a really strong view that the current farming system is fundamentally broken. Uh, we've gone down this route of intensive monoculture farming in big fields with lots of chemicals uh, and it simply isn't sustainable in the long term. Um, it's doing terrible damage to biodiversity, it's wiping out the pollinators that are necessary um, to, to pollinate the crops, um, it's doing terrible damage to the soil causing staggering soil erosion around the world uh, and of course it's contributing greatly to climate change, to carbon emissions. Uh, food production broadly um, contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we absolutely have to find a way to feed everybody, but it needs to be sustainable. Um, by definition, we shouldn't be growing food in a way that can't be sustained long term. And there are lots of alternative ways uh, of farming which actually work with nature rather than against it in essence. I could tell you more, but we'll leave that for another day or perhaps for the discussion afterwards. Broadly, to come back to where I started, you know, this is our amazing planet. Uh, it's a cliche to say, you've heard it before, but there is no planet B. We are not going to be going to live on Mars. And frankly, I wouldn't want to. Um, we have this amazing place and we desperately should look after it. I find it really bizarre that, you know, people would do anything for their children, wouldn't they? Apart from, it seems, leave them a decent planet to live on. Um, I, I, we can do better, we have to do better, and maybe we can start by looking after the wildlife in our own gardens. Thank you everybody for listening. Great, thank you very much Dave.
So that was brilliant. And seeing through a lot of comments that we've got anyway, everybody's obviously pretty excited about this topic and in hearing you talk. So thank you so much. Um, starting going down some of the questions and they're relatively difficult to go down because there are so many comments in as well. So I may end up just reading out a few comments as we go. Um, let me just, so from Tina Harris-Ross, um, what is the impact of the growing trend for artificial lawns? How can we counteract this? So, I, I, as you might guess so from what I've already said, I loathe artificial lawns. I think it's absolute madness. They, 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 their manufacture produces tons of greenhouse gases. They're, they're essentially coming from the, the petrochemical industry. They're plastics, obviously. There's no way of recycling most of them, so they end up in landfill. Um, as they degrade, they don't last forever. They produce plastic particulate pollution that goes into the air that we breathe in. Um, there is nothing good about plastic grass. Um, and I mean, personally, I, I, there was a petition doing the rounds for asking, saying that the government should ban them, uh, one of the government petitions. I, that's where I would go. I mean, I just, I know some people say, oh, but you know, my granddad is unable to mow the lawn. He's 85 or something. And he, you know, it's nice for him to have a bit of grass to sit on or walk over or whatever. Well, you know, there are alternatives. If, if you really, really can't grow grass, um, then, you know, you don't have to opt for the plastic version, you have some gravel or, uh, or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, there's no reason why you can't just have a real grass lawn, ideally one full of flowers. Great, thank you. I'm um, going to read out a comment from somebody who um, is obviously very enthusiastic and actually might inspire a few others, unfortunately named just as user. So if you do have a name and wanted to let people know, you could put it into the chat later on. Morning all, I work in a primary school where we've written a bespoke natural history curriculum. We've won national awards for our environmental work and we're a flagship school for WWF, Woodland Trust and RHS. We've also just won a national lottery grant for work on insects, which has been our whole school focus for the past two years. So pleased to be attending this. And mystery um, chatter, if you don't mind putting your name or contact in, if you're happy with it, I'm sure some people might want to contact you. Okay. Then we have a sort of comment and a question from Andy Waters. I'm also concerned about 40,000 plus low orbit satellites being quietly launched to facilitate 5G man-made microwave radiation and the internet of things. This is in addition to a network of 5G transmitters mounted every 200 or 300 meters in urban areas. Surely there must be a huge impact on insects, birds and mammals that utilize nature's natural magnetic fields. Are we creating a perfect storm of destruction for the planet's wildlife? That, that's an interesting one. I, I wish I was qualified to answer it. I don't think I am really. Um, I don't understand enough about electromagnetic fields and radiation to, to be able to judge whether there's a, a really serious threat or not. I know a lot of people are concerned about this, um, but equally, I've read what seem to be plausible, sensible scientific arguments saying that the, the levels of radiation that we and animals are receiving are nowhere near enough to do harm. And I honestly can't tell who is telling the truth. I, and I'm not sure that we really know. And that is worrying, given that, you know, we're going ahead with 5G and we are all being exposed to, to these microwave radiation. Um, uh, I would personally argue that we should stop and be damn sure it's safe before we go ahead. I'm not saying it isn't safe, but I, I, I think there's enough doubt that caution would be wise, you know, invoking the precautionary principle. Do we really desperately need 5G right now? I would say, well, actually 4G was pretty good. Um, you know, I could survive perfectly well on 4G for the rest of my life. Why do we have to keep charging ahead with technology until we're 100% sure it's safe? Of course, you could say that make the same argument about AI. Uh, we seem unable to stop ourselves from doing things just because we can, um, when sometimes they might actually be rather dangerous. But anyway, sorry, <laughs> going off topic, uh, I don't know is the honest truth, um, but I think there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that we might be worried about this. Great, thanks David. Just to let everybody know, we have a talk on 5G coming up in a couple of hours time, so we will have a speaker who um, should be expert on it, um, at two o'clock. So if everybody is worried about 5G, please come in and tune in at two o'clock. And I think um, 
the person talking is going to be talking not just about the potential dangers, but about, as Dave says, the lack of consent. We're going ahead with it at the moment without really be knowing that it works and having had a proper consultation. So please come in and listen to that. Um, then we've got one from Paige. Morning, I'm studying environmental um, conservation and writing my undergrad dissertation on the public perception of insects, specifically looking into the varying attitudes between and within insect orders to see whether increased knowledge of ecosystem services can alter negative perceptions. Well, actually, as a simple question, um, does our um, public perception of insects mediate against um, proper action to protect them? Yeah, well, it, it, it does. You know, people, they make exceptions. Most people like butterflies because they're pretty. And we're, we're incredibly shallow creatures, really, aren't we? You know, we completely arbitrarily spend millions of pounds conserving big furry things with large eyes because we think they're cute, basically. It doesn't actually make a lot of sense. And... So yeah, butterflies are okay. Um, bumblebees are generally granted exemption from the, the universal insect loathing that people have because they're kind of cute and furry. Um, but after that, you know, if you're a, a, an earwig, for example, um, you know, very, very few people um, give a stuff about earwigs. They think they're kind of slightly creepy. Actually, earwigs are really important as biocontrol agents. Most people have no idea of that, as are, of course, dung beetles and all these other creatures but it's it's absolutely true we somehow need to um as i well i started out by saying you know my mission is to try and persuade people that we should appreciate these things because they are important but because they're they're small they operate on a different scale to us they're not furry with big eyes uh, they sort of scuttle around and have lots of legs we are sort of seemingly innately um a little bit worried by them and that's made worse i think by lack of familiarity by little growing in 80% of us now live in cities where there aren't many insects, where people, you know, grow up without um, everyday contact with insects and therefore they become afraid of them. And somehow it'd be nice to change that, but it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Thank you. Um, Margaret Beasley asks, obviously referring to something you were saying in your talk, but is that a good argument for growing plants from seed and saving our own seeds of flowers and veg to sow at home? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I guess she's referring to, to the plants that in the garden centre probably all being full of pesticides. Um, there are, yeah, growth plants from seed and seeds are generally not treated with pesticides, not the flower seeds and vegetable seeds you find in the garden centre. Um, collecting your own seeds is a much more sustainable way. If, once you've got vegetables, things like leeks and parsnips, is, leave them to flower. If you just leave a couple of your leeks at the end of the year, don't harvest them and eat them let them flower. The flowers are really beautiful and the seeds are free for the following year. So, you know, much more sustainable than driving to the shops to buy more. Um, if you can't, uh, another way of getting pesticide free plants is to find an organic nursery. And there are some online. There's a really nice one called Rosie Bee I could recommend. I don't have any shares or anything, but uh, they're a lovely company that specialise in bee friendly plants, free of pesticides, free of peat, which is a subject I didn't go into, but everyone listening I hope knows they shouldn't buy peat-based compost um, or do plant swaps with your friends and neighbours that's another truly sustainable way to get hold of plants um, every keen gardener has can spare um, bits and pieces of plants that are thriving in their garden and if they thrive in your neighbour's garden they'll probably thrive in your garden so much better than going to the garden centre and buying everything in a disposable plastic pot great um Okay, question from Jess and then another one from Tina Harris-Ross coming together then. Um, have created windflower patches in my garden but want to work to link all the green areas in our suburban area with flower-rich verges and corridors. And Tina says, me too, we're attempting to convince our councils to cut the verges less. It's proving so difficult despite the fact they're signed up to the pollinator action plan. Very frustrating. Maybe you'd like to comment on that, Dave. Yeah, um, um it is difficult and often there's this kind of we're fighting against this kind of established old fashioned attitude that we need to mow all the time, that it looks untidy if the, they, if the council don't mow the road verges. And, and, and there is a significant proportion of the population who complain to the council if they don't mow the verges often enough. And of course, then there's another contingent, the more likely people listening today, who complain to the council if they do cut the verges. So the council are probably understandably somewhat confused. 
Um, I should say Plant Life, um, the charity, have been running a campaign for quite some time trying to persuade local authorities to, to reduce mowing and encourage wildflowers and road verges. So you could get in touch with them and see what they're up to and support their campaign. Um, another approach, it, which I think is really nice, there's, um, there's a little group in Stirling in Scotland, um, they call themselves On The Verge, which is just a bunch of volunteers who have persuaded the council to let them dig over uh, any, uh, so far about 93 patches of um, kind of amenity grasslands, so road verges, roundabouts, bits of parks, even inside a prison yard, um, dig them over and sow them with wildflowers. Um, and that's been really successful up in Stirling. And in fact, on the, the On The Verge Stirling has spawned On The Verge Cambridge recently and started doing the same thing in Cambridge. Wouldn't it be great if every city had a group of volunteers planting wildflowers all over the place? I think that'd be really cool. So maybe you could start your own um, uh, local On The Verge campaign. Great. Um, if you don't mind me, Dave, making a quick comment on this one. Um, and I can see Susan has also come in, come in and said, we must persuade local authorities to cut verges less and save money. They often claim residents complain about the untidiness, but we must complain back. Do. I'm a parish councillor in Hazelmere. We've declared a climate emergency. We're working on verges and trees and a lot of other things. And my, uh, my co-councillors are generally saying they don't want us to stop cutting all the verges because we'll get so many complaints. Well, we're entering into a project to put in um, wildflowers and create solitary bee corridors all over the, uh, the parish. The idea is to encourage everybody to put a one foot square area or one foot pot in their front garden with flowers in it so that solitary bees can travel um, from one pot to the other. And I'm sure Dave can explain why they need to do that much better than I can. Um, and the idea is then to have some larger patches of wildflowers where we will mow around the edge of them to make them look tidy and have the central part all full of flowers. But I would urge you, if you want action on these things, join the parish council. Most parish councils have vacancies. And if you go along and join, they can co-opt you onto it. And the first thing you can do is start dealing with verges or rewilding. It's exactly what I did in Hazelmere. They were looking out for extra councillors. They didn't have enough. I joined and two months later on, we declared a climate emergency and we started working on it. So please go ahead and do it. And maybe Dave, throwing it then back to you, if you might explain why solitary bees need these areas. Yeah, so um, I mean, many people don't understand that the majority of bees are solitary. The, uh, we have about 260 UK species of bee uh, and only about 26 or seven of those are social insects. Most of them live on their own and many of them um, nest in little holes, which you can replicate with the bee hotels I mentioned earlier and provide breeding places for them, but they also need flowers and solitary bees um, don't go very far. So a honeybee or a bumblebee can fly a couple of miles from its nest to find food and come back again. But many of the solitary bees only go one or 200 meters. Um, so they need nests and they need flowers all fairly close to one another. Um, and, and more broadly, uh, you know, one of the problems that insects face in the modern world is that there are little patches of suitable habitat, but they're isolated from one another by huge stretches of inhospitable farmland, concrete, factories, car parks and whatever else. Uh, and so it's hard, it's hard for them to survive in these little isolated populations and everything we can do to link them up um, gives them a better chance of surviving. Brilliant, thank you. And, and just let everybody know the, the local group, we're intending to create a map of all of these um, little bee refueling stations so that we can hand them out to all the solitary bees that come into Hazelmere. Um, we've got a comment, another comment from um, Andy Waters. Uh, do you have an opinion on the supposed massive insect decline in the Puerto Rico rainforest? It was stated the decline was somewhere in the region of 98% over a period of 35 years. There surely cannot be any issues with pesticides affecting decline in a pristine rainforest. Yeah, uh, so uh, many people won't have heard of this, but there was this really interesting paper. I think it was published in Science a couple uh, last year or thereabouts um, by an American scientist who basically went to some forest in Puerto Rico in, in the 70s and did insect sampling. And then he went back um, a few years ago, 35 years later, and found that essentially all the insects had disappeared, more or less all of them, staggering decline apparently. 
and there's no pesticides been used there at all. The forest hasn't been logged, it's still perfectly intact. It's a real puzzle. The original paper uh, argues that climate change is the, is the cause of the decline. There seems to have been um, a significant rise in temperature uh, of about two degrees in that forest over that time period. And that's what the authors attribute their insect decline to. But that paper has been questioned, um, uh, not least because it seems that the climate data is a bit suspect. The, there was a change to the equipment that was logging the temperature in the forest. And it seems that the new equipment is registering a higher temperature than the old equipment. So it may just be a, an artifact. Um, and it does seem implausible that, the, that, that climate change could have had such a dramatic effect um, you know, 98% declines. I, I don't, it's not the best study in the world, not least because they have no intermediate data. So they just have two time points, one in the past with lots of insects and one in the near present with very few insects. So it could be that there are, we're missing interesting cycles, long-term patterns. Some people have argued it actually is to do with hurricane, uh, hurricanes damaging the forests and you get, uh, that has a huge impact on insects. We basically, I don't think we really know what's going on there. Um, it doesn't seem 100% convincing, but we have heaps of data from um, temperate regions of, of uh, North America and Europe showing that insects there really are declining. Puerto Rico forests, I'm not so sure. Okay, great, thank you. And I can see as I'm going down, we're having dozens more, more comments about councils and mowing and what to do <laughs> about it and people talking to them. So I do urge you go and join your parish council and get on the, on the groups. They would love to have you and then you can stop this practice. Um, okay, so now from Jurif, what's your opinion of the use of non-native wildflowers? Should we be criticizing the choice of wildflower when insects need all the help they can get, especially when pollinators are not always picky about plants being native or not? No, it's true. I mean, certainly in a garden context, um, pollinators visit the plants that give them the most nectar and pollen and that they can fit into, and they don't care whether it's from China or Crawley. Um, but uh, that said, so if you're in a garden setting, I have no problem at all with people growing what, whatever they fancy, so long as it's not Japanese knotweed or whatever. Um, uh, but what I do have a bit of an issue with is, is you can get um, wildflower seed mixes or wildflower meadow mixes, uh, which people think, I, it, to me, the term wildflower is, implies native. Uh, but the, a lot of these wildflower seed mixes contain a whole bunch of non-natives from North America and all over the place. Um, now, I, I, again, have no problem if you want to sow a mix like that in your garden, but it worries me that sometimes they're sown in the countryside as a replacement for our native species-rich, flower-rich grasslands. Um, and that doesn't seem to me to be appropriate. Um, so um, in a garden, sow what the heck you like, um, but I would say if you're creating a flower-rich grassland in the countryside, you should be aiming for native species, not a bunch of North American annuals. Um, and there, so there are some advantages to native species, um, although in terms of pollinators, yeah, there's, a, there's only weak evidence that native species are better. They do seem to be slightly better on average than non-natives. Um, but the, the key thing about native plants is that they also support um, other types of insect that are herbivores. So for example, the caterpillars of butterflies. So caterpillars are much fussier than the adult butterflies about what they feed on. Caterpillars of butterflies will usually only feed on one or two species of plant and they're always gonna be native plants. So for example, if you want orange tip butterflies in your garden, you need ladies smock um, or, or hedge mustard because they're, they're the only things the larvae will eat. Um, so if you, if you grow a bunch of foreign plants, then the, the herbivorous insects that might otherwise live in your garden won't have anything to eat. So there are definitely advantages to growing native where you can, I would say. Great, thank you. Right, we've got a bit of an opinion plus a, a, um, a question from Mike Beaton. I feel as if global warming gets too much attention, not because it isn't a fact, it is, but because direct species disruption um, through deforestation, overfishing, etc., is worse. If we stopped direct species destruction, but not carbon emission, the planet would survive and adapt. Whereas if we limit carbon emission, but carry on with direct species destruction, we'll still be in a lot of trouble. Does that make any sense? 
I, I, yeah, I think it sort of makes sense. And I do agree that I think we are putting slightly too much effort into tackling climate change and not quite enough into tackling biodiversity loss and habitat loss. Um, I, for me, they're both equally important, but governments seem to have really latched on to climate change and do seem to be at least pretending to make a good effort to tackle that, whereas there's much less talk about biodiversity loss. But it, of course, it isn't an either or. These two things actually go hand in hand. The reason that wildlife is going extinct quite as fast as it is is because we're doing all of these things at once. We're destroying habitat, we're fragmenting and polluting habitats, and we're changing the climate at the same time. And wildlife can't cope with this kind of perfect storm of stresses that we're throwing at it. Um, and of course, it isn't a choice between tackling climate change and tackling biodiversity loss. Actually, most of the things we might do for one benefit the other. So to, to take a really obvious example, you know, stopping burning down the rainforest, um, which seems to everyone here, I'm sure, to be a no-brainer that we should have done many years ago, benefits biodiversity and it benefits tackling climate change. And there are many other things like looking after our peat bogs and, and uh, um, uh, that, that do the same thing. So I think we need to be looking to, to tackle both of these issues in, and finding ways to do it sort of synergistically rather than arguing over which is most important. Um, but I do agree that we need to pay more attention to biodiversity loss, which is, of course, what I was talking about today, really. Great. Quick comment here that's worth saying. When studying my undergrad, we spoke with local apple growers about introducing wildflower patches to encourage native pollinator visitation instead of spending hundreds on commercial pollinators. Surprisingly, quite a few agreed that that would be a good idea. So there's an idea for everybody else. And our mystery user who is doing so many things in her school is Alison. Um, right. From Julie. Is there a way of uniting conservation efforts with insects and pollinators? There seems to be more competition amongst conservation agencies than, than there seems to be more competition amongst conservation agencies than competition. Hmm? Participants here accepted. Sorry, competition rather than co right. There seems to be more um, competition amongst conservation agencies than cooperation. Sorry, was the question. So, is there a way of uniting conservation efforts with insects and pollinators? It's, it's a good question, and uh, I've, I've chatted to other people who've raised this. I don't know what the solution is. I mean, it's certainly true that we do have, particularly in the UK, we have a whole bunch of conservation organisations uh, from, you know, huge ones like RSPB down to tiny little charities devoted to particular insects. Um, Bumblebee Conservation Trust being a lovely example of, a, of one of the smaller charities. Um, and they're all sort of doing trying to do the same things, but they're all competing with one another for funds from you know, the limited sources of funding that are available these days for charities. Would it be better if they were all merged into a single body? I, I honestly, I mean, I don't know um, whether they would, um, but the reality is I, it'd be very hard to do. Um, uh, I don't think there's any mechanism to do that, sadly. Um, and, and I'm not quite sure whether it would actually be effective anyway. Um, but yeah, I don't have an answer. I think it's, it's quite clear. You'll have realised. Um, uh, but we are we are where we are. I don't think there, the, it, these organisations do work together. I should say. I mean, there have been lots of collaborative projects between, for example, RSPB and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and Natural England, and we're all working together uh, in a project that's been going on to try and reintroduce an extinct bumblebee in Kent. Um, so the, there is collaboration, but there is also sometimes a degree of competition, which is unfortunate, but perhaps inevitable because the charities are all trying to survive as well as achieve their kind of mission of looking after bees or butterflies or whatever. And that inevitably means there's a sometimes a bit of a battle between them for the limited resources that are available. Um, but I, I, I have no clear idea or vision as to how we might make things better, I'm afraid. I might just add to that on the just with all the climate organizations that are working on climate and things is that um, in it's very good to collaborate and get together to do a project together. But actually, if you're trying to put pressure on MPs or government or whatever, um, getting one letter signed by 100 is a lot less worrying for them than getting 100 letters they need to go through with everybody's opinions on the same thing. So sometimes it's better and sometimes it isn't. Um, from Barbara Swinfen. What is the effect of garden lights, street lighting and security lights on insects? How can we limit this? Uh, yeah, 
Um, unfortunately, there is a growing body of evidence that uh, light pollution is a significant issue for insects. Um, I mean, at it's, at its most basic because it attracts night flying insects, which obviously moths and, and many others actually, that then just sort of bash themselves to death against street lights and are also easy prey for bats while they're banging their head against the glass. Um, but more broadly, there, there's, there's also evidence that it messes up the uh, life cycle. So for example, it, it interferes with insects' ability to determine whether it's the right time of year to emerge from hibernation. Um, if, if, if there's street lighting, they think it's a long day and therefore they think it's summer and they may emerge then at the wrong time and actually find it's February and obviously then they die. Um, so there are all sorts of um, subtle effects of light pollution um, and it's difficult to tackle. Obviously, we can't easily get rid of lights. We could campaign to have street lights turned off uh, more at night. Um, for some of the really big lights, things like stadium lighting, there's quite easy to shield um, you just need to put um, shielding to stop the light spilling sideways and backwards rather than going where it's wanted. Um, and uh, I know there are some examples where that's been done with some success, um, but usually no one bothers. Um, and there's no awareness of this issue at all, really, in the, amongst the wider public. Um, and it is certainly a, a challenge, you know, how on earth do we reduce the amount of light that we spill into the environment? It's, it's not easy. Um, right, so let me give you two questions then, maybe together. Um, could you give me two, two questions together? So one from Tony Goodchild. Our local garden centre does not sell peat-free compost. Shall I boy boycott it? But what else can we do? And then a second one um, from Carissa. Just wondering what you think of mass production of houseplants? Ooh. Um, well, let's go with the peat one to start with. So, so most decent sized garden centres have at least one uh, peat free alternative and if your local garden centre doesn't then complain, tell them you're going to go somewhere else unless they do. Point to Monty Don who's been on uh, very publicly um, uh, vocally saying we need to ban peat based compost. It's absolute madness to be ripping a carbon store out of the ground and at the same time destroying a really valuable rare habitat. Um, just so that we can grow some pretty flowers in our gardens. And all the peat that comes out of the ground, once it's no longer in a, a waterlogged bog, it starts to oxidise and turn into carbon dioxide. So it'll all eventually be in the atmosphere. It's mad. I mean, government should have banned peat extraction years ago, um, but it's pathetically done nothing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I strongly feel you should boycott them um, uh, and tell them why you're boycotting them um, and tell all your friends to boycott them too until they get some peat-free uh, peat compost in. There is really good peat-free composts. Um, Silver Grow has got RHS awards for being really good. Um, so there's absolutely no excuse. I, the only thing is that the good peat-frees are slightly more expensive, but you know, what price the planet? Um, so, and houseplants, I, I must admit, I don't know much about houseplant production, but generally the mass production of, of ornamental plants for gardens and presumably for putting on the windowsill in your house, is, is a, an environmentally harmful um, activity. I mean, uh, ma most of them are imported from abroad, so there is, there's a carbon footprint associated with the shipping. Most of them are reared in very intensive conditions with lots of pesticides. Um, so, you know, I, I've got house plants, I, I must admit, but it is a sad reality that, uh, you know, almost anything you buy has, a, has, a, has an environmental cost and um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to bear that in mind every time we go out and spend money on buying something, you know, what, it, what are the implications for the environment of what we've just done? And generally, it's just best not to buy things if you don't need to. Thank you, Dave. And we'll probably, if you're happy to go on just for a couple more minutes with a, with a few yeah. questions, so that'd be great. And just to let you know, we've had actually a massive debate about uh, verges, um, as well as quite a few teachers with B programs and other things networking together. So that's been a great benefit here. Um, and I do see um, a comment from Jess, should get the local government association to develop a policy across the country. And just actually from me, uh, there's been a, a number of councillors on other previous meetings from various levels of councils. And one of them is sitting on the NALC, the National Association of Local Councils Committee on Climate Emergency. Um, and she and I are going to be talking and maybe we should put this into one of the things that could be recommended to all the parish councils up and down the country. So if you've got strong views on this, 
could you write in to me um, either on my email or come through the scientistswarningeurope.org.uk or the planetincrisis.com websites and send in your views on this, say where you are and say what your councils are doing. And let's see if we can make a case on the verges. Um, then a, a question that is related uh, from, jo uh, from Jean Laura, Isle of Mull, forestry companies in the UK are using large volumes of chemicals, including, and if I can pronounce it, ne uh, neon nicotinoids, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just got there. Um, Acetamin, uh, uh to pre-treat and top up spray young trees against pine weevils. This chemical affects a large number of non-target species, including plants. How can we put more pressure on government bodies and forestry companies to research and develop safe, cost-effective alternatives? Yeah, so um, the neonicotinoids have been the subject of a kind of ongoing international row for a long time now and many of them have been banned they're they're neurotoxins that um, are toxic to insects in really tiny quantities and so uh, the european union banned most of them from farming use um, but that some of them acetamiprid being one um, are still allowed in forestry and they're basically little trees before they're planted are drenched in these chemicals, which are often being planted in otherwise quite pristine areas, areas where there wouldn't normally be much in the way or anything in the way of pesticide pollution, perhaps. So it seems really sad that, uh, you know, trees drenched in neurotoxins are being planted across the landscape. Um, and it's claimed that it's necessary because otherwise they get a high mortality of the trees due to um, weevils and whatnot. And um, I'm no expert on growing on forestry, but it does seem to me that and they're mostly spruce trees, um, which are not native anyway. Um, I don't really know why we're planting um, large areas of spruce trees in, in the wild parts of, of Britain. I think we should be growing na native trees anyway, which would probably not suffer from these uh, beetle problems and wouldn't need treating with anything because obviously native trees seem to manage to grow quite well in Britain without any help. Um, so may maybe the root of the problem is not trying to get rid of the pesticides, but to change forestry altogether. But uh, maybe that <laughs> it's quite a big challenge. But uh, um, I, 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 I loathe these plantations of trees that we still plant. Uh, it's not quite as bad as it used to be, but it is still happening, um, in, particularly in the northern and western parts of Britain. Um, but sorry, I've rambled a bit away from the original question. We should put, we should raise awareness of this as much as we can, write to your local authority and say, you know, you don't want this chemical to be used. Point out, I think there's very little awareness again, you know, that the, these neonicotinoids have been banned from farming, but they're still being chucked all over the countryside on these trees. Great, thank you. Um, as we go down, we've had a question come in to me after I mentioned things on parish councils about why stop at parish council level, we should influence the bigger and higher local authorities. And just to say to Jess, uh, yes, we should. I wasn't saying we shouldn't do it. Um, and what everybody should be aware of is we've got county council elections coming up in May next year. Why not stand? I stood in the general election with only one policy to reverse climate change. And I did a lot of hustings in front of a lot of people or in a lot of newspapers. And I had the local Tory MP who was a climate denier previously opening his speech when he, um, he won saying, we're all now environmentalists. And so you should stand and you should go and join all of the councils at every level. And if you stand in the county council elections, you don't have to have to stand because you think you're gonna win or even want to win. You stand to make a point about the environment and about these issues that we're talking about while you're doing your campaign. So yes, we should do it at all levels of the, of the local government. Um, then from Anna, um, leading on, I think, from something you were just talking about, um, isn't it a case of non-native being fine for nectar, but natives are essential for raising larvae? Larvae. That's pretty much spot on, yes. I don't think I need to, to say more than yes. Okay. Uh, Vicky Sargent, how can we encourage farmers to cut hedges on a rotational basis so that shrubs have a chance to flower or fruit? Well, so that, that really um, should be in the, 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 we've got this new scheme, ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme Services, I'm not sure what it stands for, um, but it's the latest kind of agri-environment scheme iteration that the government has been developing 
um, which is part tied in with the new agriculture bill. Um, so Michael Gove, when he was environment secretary, said that, he, that farm subsidies in future uh, in this glorious green Brexit that we're, uh, we're, we've headed into um, would only be given to farmers in return for public goods, whatever exactly he means by public goods. Um, but that ought to include things like hedge management to, to encourage wildlife, amongst many other things. So, sorry, just to rewind a tiny bit. Um, for many years, we've given about three and a half billion pounds a year in subsidies to farmers, and three billion of that, roughly, is given as area-based payments. Basically, farmers get lots of money for having a farm, and the bigger the farm, the more money they get, which is why we've ended up with the sort of industrial farming system with huge farms. Um, half a billion was given for agri-environment schemes, uh, for public goods. Gove said that all the money was going to go to public goods, which should mean there's lots more money to pay farmers to do things to encourage wildlife on their farms. But we haven't really seen the details of this ELMS scheme, and I'm not entirely hopeful that they will follow through on Gove's promise and really deliver here. I suspect farming will end up carrying on pretty much as it has. But fingers crossed they might do something good. You never know. Okay. Great. We've got a bit of a comment here, but um, I think we can we can form it into a question. If you haven't sown wildflower seed this autumn or planted bee friendly bulbs yet, there's still time to do so. Um, we'd love to see it, but it's the planting that's important. In actual fact, I suspect there'll be some people here saying, well, which wildflower seeds or bulbs should they be planting at this time of year for the bees? Yeah, well, actually, I think as far as wildflower seeds go, it probably is a bit late. Uh, I wouldn't put them in in November. Um, September is September or April, uh, usually the best times for seeds. Um, bulbs, yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of really good ones for, for bees for early spring, um, crocus and um, grape hyacinth, um, both really good for bumblebees when they come out of hibernation and some other insects too. Um, where do you get them from? Um, there are some really good online suppliers of, of native wildflower seed mixes. Um, uh, uh, Cotswold seeds, um, Emma's Gate, um, uh, two that spring to mind, uh, both of them. Um, ideally, if you can get uh, buy, buy seed from a local company that uh, that are local provenance seeds, it's not always that easy to find. But uh, certainly, um, wildflower seeds are pretty easy to get hold of these days. Great. Uh, from Jess, uh, Dave, do you think we can really influence the green recovery to recover from COVID? Everyone has really connected with nature. Can we keep it going and also influence agricultural reform post EU exit? Yeah, I, um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it, if we if we took time to reflect and realise that actually we didn't need to fly all the time and that many of the things that happened during Brexit weren't so bad. You know, the reduced traffic and everything else, people working from home. There are some, some positives in there. Um, I fear that our government is so desperate to kickstart the economy that, that they're not really going to think too much about the environment. Um, Europe seemed to be doing more um, to, to um, use this as an opportunity. That if, you, if the government is going to put money into kickstarting the economy, to put it into green um, infrastructure and so on, but but the UK doesn't seem overly keen on that, um, sadly. Um, but yeah, you know, we need to badger them one way or another, don't we? We need to put as much pressure as we can on Boris and Co to to, to do exactly that. You know, we 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 can't forget about the big picture. The government is so focused on COVID at the moment that that it's completely ignoring that. You know. The much COVID is nothing compared to what's coming if we don't sort out the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. Um, you know, we'll we'll look back and think it was a completely inconsequential event, um, uh, and it's worrying that I don't think government is really um, looking long term and and planning ahead far enough. Um, how do we get them to do it? I don't know. Um, Ed's probably got a better idea than I have about that. Uh, yes, well, I certainly have a comment on it as well. I mean, there's certainly currently we've got the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, um, which is, and, you know, I believe, Dave, you were involved with it, that's going into mm -hmm. or trying to make its way through Parliament, and it's not going to be very successful currently for a number of reasons. Um, but the number one reason why it's not going to make any headway is there are no Conservative MPs supporting it. So 
to the assembled company and to your friends and contacts if you live in any area that's got a conservative MP, I mean, all MPs are important, but anywhere that's got a conservative MP, then get them to look at the climate and ecological emergency bill and see if you can get them to support it or at least to consider it. Even more important, if you don't know, look into the Conservative Environment Network, um, which is the group of conservatives, including about 50 MPs, lots of councillors and others, um, who are very, very pro-environmental matters. And having been to um, a number of the meetings there, it's very much like going to um, a, an upmarket cocktail party full of Extinction Rebellion supporters. So they're all on the right page and they need encouraging. So try and find out if your Conservative MP is one of the 50 or so that are in the Conservative Environment Network and then refer them to look at the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. And within the bill... Um, I would recommend you get them to look at the, um, the ecological protection measures within it and don't concentrate too much on the idea of the civil assemblies and things um, because it's about the environmental protection measures that are the most important. So please get them to look at that. Um, and we just, I'm gonna have just, we're literally at the end I think now. Um, and we've had a comment by Leslie, just it's worth saying, because quite a few have commented on similar things. Our issue is with large developers building tall towers on the edges of our London nature reserve, causing light pollution and soil temperature drops. Would like to find more evidence to support this issue and others have commented on it and that sort of thing. But Dave, do you have any um, experience of activism on these sort of um, light pollution areas where people might have some ideas to take in their local community? Oh, none at all, I'm sorry to say. Um, I wish I could come up with something uh, more useful than that. But no, that's the whole light pollution issue hasn't, I don't think is really something that people have taken seriously enough as yet. And I'm not aware of any existing examples we could learn from of um, campaigns that have been effective, sadly. The, the one thing I might add is again, get on the parish council you can affect a lot of light decisions there. You'll get to comment on all of the planning that comes in. And if the, if the parish council is prepared to work up a neighborhood plan, you may be able to do a lot of good things to, to help the environment there and stop a lot of these things. Um, so Dave, we're at the end, I think now, we've gone through virtually all the questions. Maybe if I can give you a sort of general one then just to finish off with, we're very much concentrated on action on nature. So maybe if you were gonna give us the, the silver bullet for us as individuals and the silver bullet um, for us, if we were going to look at what the government should do, and by government, I mean, we've got a year to COP26. Um, what could we look at at that high level, either at COP26 on the way to it, or simply government policy in the next year? So an individual action and something about government policy. Oh, individual action. I mean, there are actually, there, of course, there are so many things and we all need to do lots of things. But if I could just pick one, nothing to do with anything we've talked about, um, cut down your meat consumption. Uh, it's probably the simplest way to reduce your environmental footprint beyond obviously not flying to Australia on a regular basis. Um, uh, things for government. Oh, I don't know. Um, I, I, where do we start? Sorry, I'll, I'll leave that one to you. Right. OK. Yes. Well, I mean, I think the I mean, for me, for government, it's about um, getting them more energetic and motivated for COP26. So and for all those here in terms of strategy, we've got a unique environment in the UK at the moment. You know, we've got massive spending on COVID-19, which matches our World War II investments in what we were doing. And we're taking minuscule percentage points in, in dealing with the climate and, bio and um, biodiversity emergency. At the same time, we've got COP26 coming here, which is obviously a matter of pride and we're working towards it. That's why we have this event going. And what we need to do is to get our Conservative Party, our government, and our Prime Minister, who would like to see himself on the front of Time magazine holding his Nobel Peace Prize, um, and we need to get them motivated to go out and, and make a real winner at COP26 and get Boris's Nobel Peace Prize. Let's, let's put the pressure on and create the environment for them to do that. Let's do as much as we can. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining this talk. That was brilliant, Dave. Thank you very much. Total sellout. Uh, we had the full um, complement of people here as well. Um, we've got three